Hello, everyone. This is Melody Bell from Financial Beginnings, founder and CEO. And this is week three of this webinar series where we are taking segments of our curricula and bring it to life with some of our national partners. And, and so really happy. And you may have noticed I'm getting a little more casual as we go through this, right? And, and I, honestly, I, I hope this is, you know, what gets rid of business attire and makeup, in my opinion. Um, so please on YouTube, subscribe to this, share this with your social media. If you are an educator, share it with your students. The segment that we're pulling out today is talking about credit. And this is from our SAFE program, which is for college students, but we also cover a similar content in our financial foundations program for high school students. My guest today is Rod Griffin from Experian. Rod, thank you so much for, for joining me in, in your home office in, in, in Texas. And so if you can, you know, tell me a little bit more about Experian and, and the work you do there. Sure. Yeah, Melody, thanks for having me, Melody. First and foremost, always glad to talk. And with at Experian, we are well about myself first. I'm they call me senior director of consumer education and advocacy. I think the seniors just because I have gray hair now, but um, it, it is what it is. Uh, but my job is the best one at, at the company because it's all about helping people learn about what we do and how to manage their finances better and their credit better and to use a credit report as a financial tool. So I have the best job in the company because I get to help people every day. Uh, Experian is the world's largest information services provider. It is actually, people don't realize this, but it's a British company. Uh, our head, global headquarters in London. We operate in almost 40 countries around the globe. Uh, in, I'm in our North America business unit and you don't have to worry about your credit report crossing national boundaries. I always tell people, every country is different. Your credit report and your credit history stays here. It doesn't go from one country to another. Our CEO actually came from Britain, and when he came from our UK operations to the US, he lost his credit history, he had to start all over, just like everybody else. So, uh, you know, it's, we are best known as a credit reporting company. So we collect and store information about people's credit histories, and lenders use that information to help them make what we call risk-based decisions to determine that a person will repay any debts as agreed under the terms of their contract. Well, perfect. Well, I'd love to, to walk through kind of some of the basics of that in the sense of, you know, how we utilize debt and what credit means and in and, and, and experience and, and how that feeds into to credit scores and how all these companies work together. So thanks for joining me. I mean, we, we've done this before and, and it's great to be able to be so responsive in these times that we're all at home. And, and so I appreciate your, your coming on board so quickly to, to have this conversation. And so you know, one of the, the conversations that, that tends to be out there, you know, I mean, honestly, you get that knee-jerk reaction of, you know, debt, you know, it can kind of feel like this is a bad thing if I have debt. And, and so, you know, can you provide examples like is all debt bad or, or are there times where, where debt can actually be leveraged to, to help us with our financial goals? One of the things I say a lot is credit's a financial tool. Debt can be a financial problem. There's the fly we were talking about. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about like you were prepping, right? <laughs> Welcome to the times we live in. Uh, well, so I have a guest. <laughs> so I start waving my hands around. There's a fly that came from somewhere. But debt can be a financial problem, but not necessarily. If you, you can use credit as a financial tool. So debt for things like getting a degree. Uh, if you don't get too much student loan debt, and that's always the balance. If you complete a bachelor's degree, all of the research says that a person with a bachelor's degree will typically earn more than a million dollars over the course of their career than a person with a high school diploma. So if you have a few thousand dollars in student loan debt, it will pay for itself uh, in, in almost every instance. So it's debt is an investment that you can make if you do it well. The other thing I always tell people is think about it like businesses do. Now business will use debt as a financial advantage. So if they have cash, they will invest it and earn, you know, four, six, eight percent in earnings on investments. They'll borrow money for capital investments at 3%, 4%. And so they let their money make money and they use the bank's money to make the purchases. So 
use if you use credit well, it's a financial tool. Debt can be a an investment, but you have to do it right. Uh, too much debt is a problem. Yeah, and it's definitely you know when I'm talking to students, I always talk about with you know, with student loan debt, like you said, we definitely have to calculate. And, and, and in another lesson, we're going to talk about kind of what that rule of thumb is for, for how much student loan debt is appropriate based on the, the career we're going for. But you're investing in yourself, right? I mean, in, in that that earning potential. And, and, you know, you think about other aspects, too, is, you know, we have to live somewhere, right? And yeah. so if you're talking about like a mortgage and, and, and taking out a mortgage in order to, to purchase the house that we want. Um, you know, so there, there are examples now, like you said, there are examples too, where it, it, it can be a problem. So if I'm, you know, putting my Friday night pizza on, on that, uh, credit card, you know, that's yeah. maybe not the best use of well, leveraging that debt, right? Yeah. I mean, and that's, you know, two key things. If you're buying a house, getting a mortgage, you almost have to, the vast majority of us will never be able to pay cash for a house. Right. So if you're using credit, using debt as an investment in a place to live makes sense uh you know pizza and beer on friday night i remember when i was a college student it did seem like an emergency every friday night <laughs> right. not. Not. so <laughs> i had a professor who used that an economics 101 professor who's from germany i won't try to do his accent but said pizza and beer are not an emergency so <laughs> he was right and and so you know we we talk about debt and you know utilizing debt to be able to attain some of our our financial goals but can you explain in the sense of uh, you, you touched on it a little bit but what is credit how does that how does that play in what does credit mean yeah, credit is really simple it's obtaining goods or services under agreed upon terms and paying for them at a later date so you have a contract that says i'm going to borrow money to obtain up, up to make a purchase there's a contract that says you're going to pay this money back by a certain time with a certain amount of interest and that's really all it is getting goods and services that you repay at a later date under a specified contract uh, and it includes things we're familiar with things like credit cards mortgage loans car loans today that might also include things we don't think about like cell phone for example or utility service things of that sort that could be part of a credit history they're really credit like but we don't always think about them that way yeah and actually that that kind of comes into the play is like yeah where does credit come into play and you know there's there's a typical aspect of you know if i'm i'm taking out debt but like you said we're we're in the sense of phone service i'm paying that every month that's it, you know it's not this this debt that i'm carrying but yet they're they're going to be looking at my my history with that, and so, um, but then there's there's some other aspects where you know sometimes even some types of jobs or or you know in car insurance like how does you know how does how I pay my bills ha affect how I drive in in car insurance? Yeah, so and it doesn't really. But, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't right, but somehow they're they're factoring that in right. But. Yeah, so it's, so it's your, your credit history is used for a number of different things. So, so at Experian, we don't make lending decisions or financial decisions or decide whether or not you have good or bad credit. But we per, we collect and store that information so that lenders or apartment management companies or mortgage lending companies or insurance companies can dis determine the risk of doing business with you. So. You know, obviously, if you apply for a credit card or a loan, they're going to get your credit report and use that to help determine that you'll repay your debts. If you're applying for, say, a lease agreement, they may look at your credit report to help determine that you can make those lease payments on time. Uh, and it can help you pay lower security deposits, for example, if you manage your credit well, because if you have good credit, what they found is probably take care of your apartment better. Uh, utility service, kind of the same thing. When you apply for utility service, they may look at your credit history and determine that you don't have to pay as much of a, a down, a, a security deposit or a deposit to start the service because you're likely to pay on time. When it comes to insurance, they're not saying that you are a bad driver. What they're looking <laughs> at is, <laughs> what's the likelihood that you will make a claim? And exactly. will you be able to pay your premiums on time? So right. it's a financial decision. Uh, and at the same time, you know, I guess kind of in a sense, if you don't manage your credit well, maybe you're reckless driving too. I don't know. So you're likely to make a claim. But they don't say you're going to, they're not predicting you'll have a wreck. 
Um, the one other thing I would touch on and stress is that employers, if you're applying for a job, might check your credit report. They never get credit scores. So that's one of the biggest myths out there is employers okay. check your credit scores. They don't, they never get credit scores. They actually look at a limited version of your credit report. And they'll use that in one of two ways. One, if you're applying for a job that involves handling the company's money in some way, right. you can be an accountant or a clerk, or they'll use that because it's tied to their finances, which kind of makes sense. The other reason they do is to help with preventing employment fraud. So they'll use your credit report to match to the information you provide in your application hmm. to make sure you are who you say you are. So it's about identity, identifying the individual. The reason they do that, one example, I'm, as you mentioned, I'm in Texas, so in Houston they have chemical plants. So it could be a dangerous place for a bad person to work who could hurt others with it. So they'll check a credit report to make sure that they're hiring a person who says they are as a security measure uh, to help make sure that fraud isn't happening. And that's when we see credit reports used for the most part. And that's, you know, that's something to really interesting because yeah i've always talked about in this since obviously when it comes to you know having a position that relates to someone's finances um but being able to that's another aspect to be able to to verify you are who you are and and when it comes to insurance yeah i always pose this with with students and and they always get perplexed it's like how does my driving affect you know you know my insurance but you know my my hypothesis with this is that it's it, like you said, it's related to a claim. And, and so maybe if I don't have as much emergency savings, I, you know, if I get into an accident, maybe, maybe I'm willing to, to pay a thousand or $1,500 to not file a claim and, and to fix my car to where maybe somebody else would. And, and so it's really in the, the state insurance regulators actually, you know, are able to statistically tie all of these factors. Right. They can't just charge us more for insurance, just, you know, because. Yeah. And, and so with that, they've actually been able to show that, that people with, you know, poor credit are more likely to, to file a claim. I think it's really interesting, like you said, that it's not pulling that, that credit score, though. So it's, it's definitely, they're, they're looking at specific factors, it sounds like. Yeah, they are. And, and insurance companies actually do have their own version of a credit, of a credit score for insurance purposes. So it's different than the, the scores that lenders would use. Okay. And it's really built around, will you pay your claim on time or pay, pay your premium on time? Mm -hmm. And what's the likelihood you'll make a claim? And a lot smarter people than me have studied this for years and I've found there is a direct correlation between credit histories and the likelihood a person will make a claim uh, right. in, in the way that they develop. So it's really, it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, but validated. <laughs> so Exactly. Yeah. They have to, I mean, state by state, they have to be able to, yeah. to prove that they're basing the rates off of validated statistics yeah. with that. Um, and so we've, we've talked about Experian and we, and we've talked about, um, the work that, that you all do, but you know, I want to kind of step back a little bit and just talk about credit reporting agencies in, in general and then in how we access this information. So this information is being gathered uh, about uh, us and our, and our financial reporting. And, and so with that, Experian is just, you know, one of kind of three, but then also, like you said, like many agencies actually have their own reporting mechanism. So you're talking about the insurance companies or, or maybe, you know, a finance company, they're, they're going to come up with their own scoring. Um, so they're going to pull usually from Experian, Equifax, or, or TransUnion. Um, what, what is the difference in, in, in how, do, how does an agency decide or a finance company decide where they're pulling that information yeah. from? And so there are three national credit reporting companies, and, that, and that's what we do. We collect and store information. We each do it a little differently. The way I kind of describe it is it's a little bit like thinking about General Motors and Ford and Chrysler. They all build cars. We all understand how cars are. They all kind of look the same, but they, oh, the three of them do it a little bit differently to meet the particular needs of their customers. We do, are kind of the same way. We all do credit reporting. We collect information about people's debts and financial obligations. But at Experian, we believe at Experian, what we compete on with, our, with Equifax or TransUnion is the completeness of the information, the depth of that information, the accuracy of that information to help predict risk. And so that's what we're competing with each other on. Is our credit history more 
thorough? Is it more predictive? Uh, is it more accurate than our competitors uh, in the way that we store the information, the way that we collect information so that businesses can manage risk, but also to help people gain access to credit uh, and other financial resources. Uh, so at Experian, our goal is to be thought of as the consumer's bureau. We want to help people connect with business. We don't want to be a barrier, which means you need to understand what's in a report, how credit reporting works, how credit scoring works. So that's why I have the job I have. Um, and we talk about how do you get that report and, and the, the slide shows annualcreditreport.com. That's a website that provides access to get a free credit report from each of the three national credit reporting companies once every 12 months. So it's not calendar year, it's once every 12 months. So if you get a report today, you'll have to wait until this date next year to get another report. Uh, but it's everybody's entitled to a free report at least once a year. The reality is you can get free reports from lots of places if you use that free report uh, you, if you find information with Experian, for example, that you need to dispute, you can come to our dispute portal, experian.com slash dispute. And if you, you don't already have a free report that's current, we'll give you a free one. Uh, if you are unemployed seeking employment, a victim of fraud, uh, if you have a declination so you don't get approved when you apply, you can get free reports. And in some states, they offer free reports under state law as well. So a lot of ways to get free reports. And, and you should. You yeah. should, and actually this is a good opportunity. Maybe, I mean, a lot of us are at home now and maybe find that we have a little bit more time on our hands. This is a great opportunity for us to kind of take stock in in our financial situation and, and you know, understanding our credit report because, you know, one is just pulling this information to, to understand where we're at, but two is to find, I mean, I have students that will log in and they've never maybe taken out credit before and, and they log in and they find that there's all these trades or, you know, like credit that's already been established for them, that they, they may have already been a victim of fraud. And so it's better to, to get ahead of it and to understand and, and correct those situations as opposed to when maybe you're going to buy a car or apply for, for you know, a loan of some type and, and find that you have that to all clean up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, don't be afraid to get a report. We tell people that all the time. The sad thing is that only well, less than half of people who are qualified to get a free report every year through annualcreditreport.com actually request it. So we want people to get that report because it helps us too in making sure that the information we have is complete, that it's accurate, that it is there to work for you. So don't be afraid to get the report first and foremost, and we can help with fraud. And so. You know, I'm, I'm curious to hear from you. Um, what do you recommend? Do you recommend getting it all at once and then just setting a calendar a year from now? Do you recommend spreading it out? What's, what's kind of the best practice? Yeah, so the answer to every question you can ask me about credit is it depends. Yeah, right. so it depends, right? Uh, so it depends what you're doing. If you can use it sort of as a de facto monitoring service, so get one from Experian and then wait a few months and get another one from Equifax and then your third one from TransUnion a few months later that can work if especially if you don't find anything or have any reason to believe there's a problem if you find something you're not sure about get the others as well uh, right away because you can work with all three of us that way you know, to make sure that everything is like it should be so to look at the report if there's you know if you're planning to apply for credit buy a car buy a house might make sense to get all three at the same time you know, so look at your situation and, and decide from that and this is kind of, you know, something I'm curious of that, that I've never asked you before. So is there kind of specific industries that look to, you know, of the Equifax or TransUnion or, you know, that, you know, I know, like, I know if I'm going to buy a house, they're going to pull from all of you, right? They're going to pull from the three major bureaus and, and, and calculate that. But if I'm going to buy a car, they're not necessarily going to pull from all three. Are there specific industries that that go for of the agencies? No, not really. I mean, we're all, in most cases, lenders will get reports from all three. Lenders decide which one might be their preferred report. And they have lots of reasons for that, you know, and it just depends on the particular lender. Um, but they, they typically will request all three reports. They'll get scores for all three reports as well. And if you're buying a car or a house, like if you're getting credit cards, they'll usually look at all three. Okay. Uh, they decide, and so, and they don't have to. I mean, and they don't have to. Lenders don't have to report either. It's a voluntary system. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, some small like local or regional banks may report only to one or two of the, the credit bureaus by choice. Uh, most of them report to all three. Uh, and when they, you apply, they'll get all three. They may look at one of, of the reports or they may take the middle score, that kind of thing, depending on what, what's happening. So we talk about the reporting agencies. So essentially, you know, uh, the, the finance companies are reporting this information to you have this debt and, and you're paying it and here's how much the payment is and, and all of that. And so now let's talk about the credit score. And, and when I'm explaining this to students, I, I kind of talk about, you know, if they turn a paper into me and I, and I mark it up and I've got all these red marks and I hand it back to them, they're like, this means nothing to me, right? Like they, 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 you know, like you marked it up, but essentially what they want to know is what's my grade, right? Yeah. And, and so when it comes to the, the credit score, that's the, the opportunity essentially to kind of put a grade on, on our, our, you know, credit, right? Yeah. I mean, and that's exactly how I describe it. If you think about a, a paper, a teacher and a grade, it kind of is, a perfect analogy. Your credit reports like the paper that you produce as a student. You decide how you're going to use credit, how much you're going to borrow, how much you're going to pay back, you make those payments on time. You build that credit report, the credit history. The teacher, you kind of act like the bank. So the bank will ask for your credit report, they'll get your credit report, and then they can apply a score or have us apply a score. We'll route your report through a score. A score is a separate process. It's like the grade. So the bank assigns the grade. They decide how to use that report to identify risk. And there are lots of different credit scores. You have three reports. You have, have lots of different credit scores. Just like when you go to school, you have lots of teachers and they all may have their own kind of grading scale. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, with a, a credit score, it's like the grade. They use that credit score to evaluate the information in the credit report and they assign a score. And that score, it represents the relative risk of lending to you. A high score usually means you're at good risk and you'll, you'll pay them back as agreed. A low score means you probably won't. And so you want to have as high a score as possible generally to, to get the credit you want. And, and so when you're looking at that, I mean, because the, the range can be very low in the 300s to it's up to 800. But usually if you're looking to get that kind of prime rate, that, that best interest rate, you, you know, you're probably going to be talking about that over 700. But it, it varies depending on the time and, and the circumstances, right? Yeah, it does. And it depends on the scoring system that's used. Mm -hmm. So generally what we think of as prime, you'll hear that, that word used. Low prime starts about 700, high prime 750 and above. So if you have scores of 750 and above, generally you're gonna get the best terms and the best rates. Uh, that number can differ depending on the lender. Some have higher risk tolerance than others. And it also depends on the type of lending so, and the type of lender. So it, you know, it gets a little more complicated. If you're buying a car, the scores they use from FICO, FICO is a scoring company, Vantage Score is another one, they have their own scales, they have multiple scores. FICO's scores for auto lending go to 900. So mm -hmm. you might have a score that's higher than 850. Uh, and so if, you, if you're you know, going to school and you wanna make a bet, you know, bet somebody on your score, you can always find one that has a higher scale and can, you can win. <laughs> so I never lose a bet on scores. Um, but lots of different scores. Credit unions use different scores than national banks because their customers are different. So the score is a tool used to evaluate the information in the report, kind of like a grade represents what's in the paper. It's really that simple. And like you said, it varies from professor to professor and, you know, and, um, and, and so with that, you know, the nice thing that I've seen over the years is, is that we, we do have easier access. So now it's, you know, I log into any of my, uh, credit cards and they you know they update my credit score if you go to to mint or, or credit karma you know they they have those credit scores so are they utilizing fico or are they utilizing their own system do you know yeah it depends uh, it's the that question if you go to experian to our app or experian boost if, if you want to have your cell phones reported utilities we'll give you a fico 8 score so that's what we provide uh, others may provide a vantage score some have their own proprietary scores. Uh, they're all real scores and they're all legitimate uh, real scores. They represent the information you report. They use the same kinds of 
so technology and, and algorithms, you know, they're all a little different but and have different scales, but still legitimate. So I don't like that FACO word we hear. I think that's kind of, the FACO scores is a fraudulent term. There really right. isn't such a thing. There's lots of different scores. They're all legitimate. But always ask, you know, and at Experian, you're going to get a FICO 8 score uh, in, as far as I know all the time now. So. And the nice thing is that, you know, the, the, the point of this, I think, that's really cool is that we're able to, to track that and see that progress and, and, and hopefully, you know, be improving that. And so, you know, no matter what the score is, even if that is going to be applied to, you know, differently from an auto loan to a mortgage to, to wherever I'm, I'm applying for that financing, if, if I keep my kind of thumb on the pulse, it's a good opportunity for me, me to keep my thumb on the pulse as opposed to, you know, it is hard when I'm looking at my credit report and I just see all this information to, to just get a gauge on where I'm at. Yeah, it, it's exactly right. I mean, the score, a couple of things, when we, you get a score from Experian, you also get what we call the risk factors that go with that score. So they tell you what from your credit report most affected the number you got. So it lets you go back to your credit report and know what to look at. So that's what's really empowering. The number give you a sense of where you stand uh, and getting the factors to work that tie to your report will tell you what you need to focus on so that you can do something about it. So it makes that connection. Um, you know, the, the other thing to understand is that when you get a number, it probably won't match what your lender gets because right. when you go apply, time will have passed. They may use a different score. The thing to know is if you get a good score from one system, you're going to have good scores on the others too. I've never seen a case where you have a great score of one and a terrible score of somebody else. It just doesn't happen. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So it's, you know, don't panic when you don't get exactly the same number. That's okay. You're right. probably close. Now, when it comes to what makes up our score and, and, I, I like to kind of, you know, we can kind of talk about the bigger categories of this. It, there is kind of this mis, I mean, well, I would just think I pay my bills on time. I should have perfect credit. Right. And, and that's not necessarily the case. And especially when you're talking about maybe a, a college student or, or, or somebody that's younger, that's in that point of a, establishing credit. So obviously payment history is, is very important in, in, you know, paying our bills on time. Uh, also understanding, you know, the, the lenders are giving us this um, amount that they're letting us. So if it's, I have a credit limit of $1,000 on this credit card, it actually can go against me if I borrow $1,000, but yet that lender told me that, right? And, and so that's where that, that balance to, to ratio of, of what I have for the, the debt makes a big difference, right? Yeah, it does. And, you know, there, there's no real secret to having good credit scores. You, as you said, you have to pay your bills on time every time. Uh, and that means things that are reported. So your credit cards, you know, your loans. So, and some things aren't often reported. So utilities, things like that may not be. So and people ask me that all the time too. Well, I pay my cell phone on time. I pay my utilities on time, but they're not, they're not helping. Why? In experience as a service that can help with that, but won't go into that. Uh, but, if you're paying those bills on time, first step, that's 35 to 40% of a score. The credit card issue is what trips people up. That's the second most important factor right. always at every score. And you need to keep your balances as low as you possibly can. The, the lower the better. Pay the balance in full if possible, because if you don't, you're just gonna pay interest. It's gonna cost you more money. It's not gonna help your score. So pay the balances in full. The higher your balances are, the more risk there is that you won't be able to pay it back. It's as simple as that. So if you've maxed out your card and then you get sick or you hurt yourself, stub your toe, wreck your bicycle, you're gonna be potentially not able to pay that bill on time. And so it's more risk. If it's a lower balance, you can still better chance. So that's really what underlies that. So you wanna keep your balances low, pay your bills on time. Everything else in a score builds on those two things. You know, and I think it's important to understand that it's not, so I, I'm one of those, um, I, I think maybe even the credit card companies call me a deadbeat because I, I, I use the rewards, right? And yeah. so I, I'm, I'm maxing out, my, you know, my credit. And I think what's important to also understand is it's that build balance. So even if I am paying that credit card in full every month, if I have that thousand dollar, you know, limit and I'm charging 900, even if I'm, you know, paying that 900 the next month, 
all that's going to show on that. And so really for me, what's important is to pay that balance down before it bills, right? Yes. I mean, and that's, that's the, the challenge, it, you know, and I talk to other people too, that you know, they'll max out cards because they want to take advantage of the points or the airline miles, whatever it might be. And that can work against you. Generally, if you're paying them in full, the balance it will show is usually what's on your billing statement. So be aware of that. Right. Um, you know, if you're doing it well, probably not, and it's consistent, it may not have as big effect on, on your scores because they, they see that pattern. Um, but it can, it certainly can. Well, that's good to hear. I, that makes me feel a little better if I, I yeah. forget, <laughs> but I do, I do make sure I want to yeah. max out those, those points and, and I am paying it off every month. Um, and so, you know, with that, yeah, I mean, those are the, the two big factors to, to really focus on is paying my bills on time. Now, it's okay if you slip up a little bit, right? I mean, if, if my payment is due on the first and you know, something happens to where I forget or circumstances happen to where I can't pay it until the 10th, that's not going to affect my credit still. Right. True. Yeah. It, it, with credit reporting late means 30 days late. So right. it's a full billing cycle. So in your credit report, you won't see the payment was a day late. We don't see a late payment until, 30 days after it was due in most cases, sometimes a little longer than that. So you'll see 30 days late, 60 days late, 90 days late in a credit report. So if you are late from your due date by a day or two, then you pay it. You don't have to worry about your credit report. You might see late payment fees or higher interest rates from your lender. So there's still potentially penalties, but it won't be from a credit reporting standpoint. And if I'm 30 days late, essentially I'm two payments behind then. Exactly. Right. Yeah. When I have students that are, are looking, one is, you know, how, how do they establish credit? How do they do this in a healthy manner? Because, you know, you can go to every department store and they want to offer me the 10% the mm -hmm. discount. Um, you know, what are, what are your recommendations for, you know, maybe somebody, so my, my daughter is 18 and she's going off to college. You know, how, how do we manage that well to still put us, set us up for success if we want to, to buy a house down the road, but then not have that bad debt? Yeah. And there's several things that, and, and you know, I have kids and grandkids and, you know, we talk about money all the time. And I think that's kind of the first step. Be sure you're talking to your kids about how it works and how money works. Uh, add, you can add a child as an authorized user to an account, for example, which means they have permission to make charges. As a parent, you don't have to give them the card, so they can't really go out and make charges. So it gives you some control. Uh, but if you go with them and let them make charges while you're there and then sit down with them at the end of the month, and walk through that billing statement and explain that you had not free money, you have to pay it back, what interest is, use it as a teachable moment I think that can be really powerful and then help stress that you know, what a financial emergency is if that card's for emergencies. So they understand that going forward and know the implications. Uh, so having them as an authorized user, you might help them with a, a secured card. So a, a deposit in a savings account. So you start a savings account and they have a, a low limit credit card and, and they are able to use that as long as they're paying it well and that can help establish credit history as well as savings. So that can be a a double benefit uh, and you know but it's always the same kind of thing they have to understand that if they use a, a credit card in particular that they aren't overcharging that they're able to pay it back uh, and what the implications are uh, if you're a student and you have student loans you're going to establish a credit history and be sure that you're asking the right questions you know make sure you're asking do I really need all of this money because lenders are going to offer you what they say you can afford but you might define afford differently uh, you know, you will have to repay it later. So do you need all of the money or can you say, no, I just need X amount less than what you're offering because I only need to pay tuition and my books. I don't need room and board or, you know, that sort of thing. I can Whatever go home do. and I can, uh, yeah, I can feed off of my parents, right? <laughs> yeah. So how do I take on less debt? Um, but have a plan. You always have to have a plan with credit. And, and, you know, I always stress with my family and with people I talk to, Credit is a trade-off. If you're going to buy something using credit, if you're going to take on debt, it means that you're going to have to not buy something else until it's paid, that debt's paid off or delay buying something else until it's paid off. Uh, 
so always have a plan. Know how you're going to repay the debt, when it will be paid, um, and what you're going to have to give up until it is paid. Yeah, and I um, that's my rule of thumb. Is if if you're taking out debt then you need to calculate what that total cost is going to be. So yeah. yeah, like you said, what is that plan? So if it's, I need a laptop for going, you know, doing my homework at school and, and I know that I'm going to work every Saturday to be able to pay this off in three months over the summer, then that's a plan and, and calculate that out, understanding what the interest is that I'm going to be paying on that. And so you know, depending on what the cost of the, the laptop is, what is that cost plus the interest that I'm going to be paying on and, and making those informed decisions, which I think are, are so important. Um, with my daughter, so I, I did exactly what you just recommended. I, I made her an authorized user on our credit card a year or two ago. And honestly, it was, it was just selfish. I mean, it was just, I was, you know, she could drive and I was sending her to the store or, you know, she's paying for SAT exams and I'm constantly transferring money to her bank account and it was just a pain. So, you know, I, I, I gave her uh, a credit card that, that was on ours. Is there a difference on, on how that is, is viewed? I mean, it's, it's a great way to be able to establish credit, but is there a difference? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, when you're an authorized user, let me back up. It, when you have an account in your name, it will show in your credit report and it will show what we call the account association. So how are you associated with that account? So for an authorized user, the credit, the account would show in their credit report and it would show authorized user. On your card, in, in your case with your, you and your daughter, on your credit report, it would show primary account holder or primary uh, loan holder. So it, it shows that you're responsible for the debt. The authorized user is not. With Experian, with an authorized user account, if that account becomes late and becomes negative, we will remove it from the authorized user's credit report because they're not responsible for that debt. Right. So it's a safe way to help a young person in particular you know, build credit uh, for them, not necessarily for you if they decide to charge too much. That's right, yeah, the, right. That risk, right. So she gets all the advantages and none of the negative. Exactly, exactly. And, and now I just learned uh, probably in the last, six months to a year about Experian Boost. And, and I've had some of my, my college students talk about this where, and you kind of just spoke about it briefly, but I would, I would love to hear more because it's, it's essentially my understanding. It's an opportunity to where I, I am proving myself that I'm, I'm paying utilities that maybe aren't reporting or I'm paying rents, but it may afford me an opportunity to, to get that somehow, right? Yeah, you actually know two things that we do. Uh, so rent's actually a separate thing from Boost. Um, so Experian a year ago launched a product we call Experian Boost, or really service. And what it does is with your permission, we will go to your checking account or savings account. I believe we've added credit cards now and capture the positive payment you made for your cell phone or your utility. So things like natural gas, water, electricity, even cable television or satellite television bills and add them to your credit reports as positive accounts. And so each month we go capture that payment, put it in the report as a positive payment. What that does is for, for people who are establishing credit, you have what we call thin credit files, fewer than five accounts or scores that are below 680, so the lower credit scores who, and they're building their report. It lets them show that they should be a good credit risk, they just haven't had the opportunity to have a traditional credit history. And so in the past, cell phone companies, utilities didn't report positive information. So our goal is to give people the ability to do that with their permission. So they show, look, I pay my utilities on time. I pay my, my cell phone on time. I just don't have any traditional accounts or only have one or two. And so we give them credit where credit's due and, show, and we've done the research to show that it actually indicates you're a good credit risk. You just haven't had a history to in a traditional sense to show that. Um, we're seeing average increases of about 13 points. For most people, if you have a thin file, more like 19 points. So uh, really proven to be a powerful tool. It's real easy to do. You just go to experience.com slash boost and follow the instructions. Um, we'll give you a score for free and at the start and at the end, you can see what happens. So really simple. I've, I've heard good reports from my students. So. 
Um, and you mentioned rent. Rent reporting is yeah. different. So just so you know, if you're renting, uh, you can search Experian rent reporting. And I can't remember the URL, but you can talk to your landlord, uh, whether it's one bedroom, you know, one unit in a house or a 10,000 unit complex, and they can report your positive rent payments as well. Uh, so, uh, and we've seen almost 100% increase in credit scores or uh, um, becoming scorable uh, if you weren't before when you see rent reported too. So two different services that we, we provide. Well, yeah, it's likely, you know, probably your largest, you know, payment that's going out. And so being able to capture that, that history, I would think would be very valuable. Yeah. Well, Rod, thank you so much. I, I learn something every time I, I speak with you and I really appreciate your, your time with this. Is, is there any kind of last words of wisdom that you would like to share or even just in the times that we're at, that we're all in our home? Mm -hmm. And I know I have several students that uh, have been laid off and, and you know, with these situations to, to be mindful of with, with this current COVID-19 situation. Yeah, it's really unique for everybody and really challenging. I have family that's affected as well with job loss and loss of income. So um, it's touching all of us. At Experian, we are doing a lot to try to make sure you have the information you need. Uh, if you go to Experian.com, you'll find a COVID-19 resource center. It has lots of information. We're actually live, uh, myself and my colleagues, on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, uh, on Periscope, on Twitter, and on Facebook Live, answering questions and engaging in, in providing information live and in person. So if you go to ex.pn slash credit chat, you can learn about our Twitter chats on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock Central, 3 Eastern. You'll find me on Periscope, 1.30 Central, 2.30 Eastern on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and on Facebook Live on Fridays at 11.30. And you can learn more about that at ex.pn slash credit chat live. Uh, so lots of resources. We want to talk to people because we know everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. and We're all in it together. So the more we can share, the better. Well, I, I really appreciate this because uh, we have all, you know, worked together for several years. And as you know, our programs are typically done in the classroom and Spring of last year, we were in 500 plus classrooms and now everybody's at home. And so being able to tap into you as a resource and you've always done an amazing job of being able to uh, have that social media presence. And, and so I, I appreciate your partnering with us to, to be able to, to share this information. No, the pleasure is mine. Thank you for having me, Melody. Anytime we can share information and talk, let me know. I'm happy to. Well, with that again, uh, we are trying to boost our YouTube subscribers. So please subscribe to Financial Beginnings YouTube channel and also share this information. Next week, we're going to be talking about saving for college. And my guest is going to be David Bell. And I'll, uh, the name is not a coincidence. And he is the deputy director of the Oregon Savings Network, and, and they oversee the Oregon College Savings Plan. But he is also my husband, which I, uh, Rod, I think you have met before. And, and with this, we're gonna kind of provide a little more of a personal twist to our webinar, is we have a senior who is going off to college, as well as an eight-year-old that we are saving for college. So we're, we're gonna tap into our own experience as well as the, the different aspects that we can tap into as parents to be able to save for our college, uh, children's college education. So thank you so much again for Rod, Rod for joining me. Well, thank you.